we're often, uh, you know, we're walking wounded. We're trying to help others, but we ourselves are having issues or challenges that are, are really weighing down on us. So uh, this is the whole conversation that we'll have today. So um, I'm going to just go straight into the presentation. It's a lot of material. Um, I'll give you my email at the end so you can uh, access the presentation and go through it a little bit more at your leisure. I see a couple of people are still uh, to join. Yeah. But I'll come back and recap this that uh, uh, after we've started. But our topic today is uh, this idea of the leader as a wounded healer, we're putting it. And um, yeah, it's it's just a concept uh, I've been speaking on for, I would say, the last three, three or four years. When I speak on it, a lot of people are really um, resonant with the depths and the material. So it's, it's a popular thing that I'm often asked to speak on. Um, but uh, it it stems the 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 phrase stems from or was popularized by a man called Henry Nowen who wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. And uh, in it, he said, nobody escapes being wounded. We're all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. And the main question is not how can we hide those wounds, but rather um, how can we put that woundedness in service of others. It's, it's a funny concept to think of it that way. But uh, he goes on to say, when our wounds cease to be a source of shame, a source of healing for others, we have become wounded healers. So this is my topic for today. I hope uh, it's uh, clear. And uh, Beryl or Gabriel, I need you just uh, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, if we need to recap, if the internet on my side isn't the best. So as we've said, this concept of the leader as a wounded healer uh, is a that, that all of us who are to be strong for others and maybe be a shoulder for others to lean on as a leader, we're also struggling with various challenges of our own. In other words, we too have been wounded in the battlefield of life. Uh, and so often, while we are tasked as leaders to carry others, we ourselves are walking wounded. So you can see the screen. Um, it's a picture of a soldier, and he's got a bandage on his left leg and knee, but he himself is carrying someone, his buddy, who's much more worse off than him. So this is the idea that we're talking about today, a uh, leader as a wounded healer. Just to recap a bit about myself, uh, Gabriel started. I'm married. I have two grown children. My wife and I are dual citizens, uh, Uganda, U.S. citizens. I'm a co-founder and director of Cornerstone Development Africa, and also a co-founder and patron mentor to AYLF. I'm based in Uganda, but we work right through the, the six countries that border U Uganda, which is DRC, South Sudan, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, plus Burundi. So there's about a staff of about 250 and in our organization. Um, I grew up here in Africa, um, in, mostly in the countries of uh, Congo, Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda. And my parents were in Africa even before I was born. And uh, for primary three, I was at Hill, Hill School in Eldoret. Uh, it was mostly a British, like a white Kenyan British school at the time, but we were uh, a group that was displaced when there were some uh, problems in Congo, and we came over to Eldoret to run that school. It was an American school based in Congo that migrated to Eldoret for a year. And then afterwards, uh, later on for high school, I was at Rift Valley Academy in Kijabi, Kenya. We used to play on the rugby team uh, against schools like Lenana, Nairobi School, Alliance, Strathmore, and so forth. Um, that's Kijabi is up near the Rift Valley between Nairobi and Nakuru. And um, my mother died in an accident, car accident around Nakuru, and she's buried up there. And 
in uh, Kijabi. So I like to say I have a little bit of uh, my heart is always in Kenya. But the truth is, I feel like my country is the whole world. I've had a privilege to travel in almost all continents. And I just started to get this perception that uh, these borders that divide us as human beings are not the way that God wanted us to see uh, the world. And so this is my father's world. This is God's world. And I like to think of uh, all countries as that. So whether I'm in Kenya, I'm in Uganda, I'm in Tanzania, like where I am now, it's just I, I like to see people everywhere as my people. I see them as I see them as my sisters because they're created in the image of my father. That's just a little bit about me. I'm a Christian, I come from a Christian background, but I like to just say I sometimes and to love my neighbor as myself, because that was, as I said, was the sum of all the law and the prophets, and it was the greatest commandment. So that's just a little taste of health. And this is a picture of my family. Um, it was taken last year. My daughter on the right side and her family live in the States, and my son on the left side and his family live in in Kampala, Uganda, with us. So the topic today is uh, the leader as a wounded healer. And uh, it has several uh, aspects to it, uh, but the kind of wounds we are talking about in life are, are things like relationships, family issues, physical health wound, poverty wounds, things that have been running in our families, or psychological wounds, emotional, sexual abuse wounds. There's a whole category. There's all kinds of categories, I could say, of various kinds of wounds in life. So we're talking about the leader as a wounded healer. And I'm sure everyone on this call has been wounded in some capacity in one of these areas. And uh, it just seems like this whole area of psychosocial health, mental, uh, emotional, mental health, is really coming to the forefront and into the mainstream awareness of society. I, I think in the past, African countries and people, they didn't even have terms like depression. Uh, they would say sadness, but sadness would come and go. But the whole uh, kind of like uh, awareness now of some uh, psychosocial or emotional mental issues. Before this was only understood by professionals, so you would have to go see a counselor or, or certain people who are trained to have this kind of like in-depth knowledge. But now this is all coming out onto the mainstream and the terms that have been used by psychologists like setting boundaries, getting triggered are now part of, uh, you know, many people's common vocabulary. And this is because the Internet is bringing out lots of information that previously was only held by professionals, but now it's it's available to everyone if you just know how to do good research and you get some basic concepts uh, like the ones we're going to cover today. Yeah, so there's been an explosion of interest in this whole area and, you know, these terms that are very common to us now, de stress, depression, anxiety attacks are really something that... Uh, of us have uh, first-hand experience with, or it's in our families, family members who are depressed and so forth. But we, like in AYLF, to look at life in these four areas, the spiritual, the mental, the social, and the physical. And today we're looking more at the mental, social aspect, psychosocial health, that, uh, you know, pertains to our thoughts and our emotions and our, our relationships. And uh, to get health in each of these area, areas, there's are some healthy habits or there's some knowledge that is required and that can be learned to get uh, health in all of these four basic to experience that. And you can see the letter B standing for balance and well-being. And I think that's a place that all of us want to be in, but 
at times we uh, neglect certain and it becomes like a problem area to us. But uh, yeah, all over the world, there's almost like an epidemic that's spreading uh, called depression. We've come out of COVID, but depression seems to be everywhere. And like I say, African languages didn't even have a, a word for it. They would say sad is something that would come and go. But now chronic depression, something that is um, setting in and staying with people for years. So this is what we're talking about today. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. more of a long-term widespread phenomenon. We're starting to see it more in the young people, especially in East Africa. I saw this uh, from a Kenyan newspaper a few uh, years back, and it said suicide is the second leading cause of death in 14 to nine-year-old number one. Uh, but and it says four out of five people who commit suicide are depressed, and we're also seeing lifestyle to substance abuse in uh, Kampala, Uganda. We have this uh, national referral mental hospital, and majority of patients are university and high school students suffering from alcohol, drug addiction, uh, or abuse. And I'm sure this is uh, you know, something you've also um, seen in Kenya. I know it's also in Rwanda where I spent a fair bit of time. But uh, it's a really people region. Um, the universities are pumping out thousands of graduates every year, but there's only a certain percentage of jobs that the economy is generating to kind of absorb them. And uh, some people are talking about something called the quarter life crisis, which hits sort of post university where um, you're trying to relate just and uh, yeah, a term that's involving loneliness, depression, disappointment among this particular demographic that we work with in AYLF. Some people call it inversion. I know like you've been in school doing your best, trying to move from primary to secondary. Then you get to university, and then you finish university, and then it's like you step off a cliff into a, a void, and it can take uh, one or two years to get work. This is what I'm seeing now. As before, you would get something within a few months. I would, if you're in that space, I would just say be patient, or you're heading to that space. Uh, I do see people getting jobs, but it's taking a bit longer, and, and a lot of jobs are coming after a lengthy internship. But this is really the, you know, the, the group that AYLF uh, deals with, and we see a lot of our young people turning to what we could call unhealthy coping habits to deal with this kind of psychosocial um, stress, anxiety, depression. So... All these things listed on the screen, you know, addictions of all kind, alcohol, smoking, and so forth, are like you know, excessive social media, sleeping too much, sleeping too little. It's all related to just uh, coping habits and things that people are trying to do uh, to uh, deal with uh, stress, anxiety, or depression. But in many cases, these are unhealthy habits that compound problem. And these are all feeding into depression. And depression isn't just sadness. A lot of people are depressed, uh, talk about being empty. They have a feeling of nothingness. Some of them have a feeling of self-loathing, like their parents have been struggling to put them through school and now they can't perform in the way that they thought and they just like feel guilty and have this. And then you see the word isolation there. Uh, this is a very... Uh, recent phenomenon in African culture due to the smartphones. Uh, before, you know, African families would live together. Everything was just done in close proximity with others. There was nothing like someone hiding themselves in a bedroom on a phone all day long, so, which is a big factor. Isolation always uh, is a factor in depression. So, yeah, this is just getting us 
to be familiar with this kind of uh, situation that some of us are experiencing or we have close uh, friends or family members who are going through it. Okay, so this is our topic of the day, a leader as a wounded healer. I hope it's all, uh, our internet is stable. If not, just jump on and tell me. I'll be talking about uh, four points related to this concept of a leader as a wounded healer. So the first is just the idea of a leader as a healer. That might be a new way of looking at it for you. Then secondly, leader as a wounded healer. And then thirdly, vulnerability as a leader. Uh, this is something that's also shifting the perception of what it means to be a leader and how, um, yeah, being vulnerable is actually making yourself more human and people actually, the research is showing people trust people who are a little bit open and don't seem to be just uh, made out of cast iron or something. And then the last is where we'll spend most of our time. So I'll go through the first three quite quickly, but the last one is pathways to healing. Uh, ways that we process or tools or techniques that are available as pathways to healing. So yeah, the first one, leader as a healer. Um, uh, there's a book out that talks about this called Leader as a Healer. And basically, all good leaders serve as healers in the spaces that they're in or the community on two levels. First of all, we are tasked to lead in such a way that we solve or heal some problems in the communities or the or the, the places where we are um, leading. Uh, we address in society, we heal divisions that are dividing people. Uh, and forge a way forward. So this is the first one. A leader is a healer in the way that they solve problems on a community level. The second one is that uh, we who empower and help people, we're often uh, called upon or tasked to uh, help people overcome their personal struggles. So we're not only dealing with the things that are in our organizations or in our, in our communities or in our workplaces, but we're also, uh, people perceive us as someone they can go to to get advice or to get some um, guidance on their personal struggles. So we're the ones who have to be strong and give us a to problem, have to try and advise and encourage others when they're going through uh, hardship. So the leader as a healer, basically these two areas, solving community problems, but also helping. So I left. Uh, we like to reference the principles, precepts, and person of Jesus, or Nabi Isa, as he's known in the Quran. And this concept of a leader as a healer can be seen in Jesus, uh, especially when he was launching his public campaign. He stood up in the temple, I guess it was in Jerusalem, and took up a scroll. And he read some words uh, from the ancient Hebrew prophet Isaiah. And then at the end of it, he says... Uh, this is now being fulfilled, meaning this is what he came to achieve as his mission. So he read this, these words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's appointed me or anointed me to be proclaimed good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, and to comfort all who mourn. So just in this kind of was his launching manifesto at the beginning of his campaign. You can see this concept of a leader as a healer, someone who is impacting uh, the society in a positive way, but is also there to give uh, comfort to people who are struggling. So that's the leader as a healer, the first concept. The second one, leader as a wounded he healer. Uh, this was from the very first slide, or one of the first slides I showed you, that all of us who are trying to be strong for others, we're actually struggling and juggling various challenges of our own. I know that Gabriel is a leader in AYLF, but I know that he has things that have been hard uh, that he's had to deal with in his personal life and so forth, and I'm, I'm the same way. So we, we who are... Uh, 
trying to be there for others. We have been wounded in the battlefields of life at times, and we're tasked to carry others, but we ourselves are often uh, quietly walking wounded. And the picture shows the man who has a bandage on his left leg. You can't see it too well, but he's carrying his buddy who's even worse off. That's the second one. Now the third one, vulnerability as a leader. I think this is a tough one, especially for men, maybe more so for African men. But it's this concept uh, that there is no shame to admit that as leaders, we're not perfect. We're human. We get wounded in life. And uh, there's a way it makes us better leaders because it builds trust. It creates more honesty and authenticity in a group when we at times uh, let people know that we're also um, struggling with something or other, or there's a, you know, our family's going through a tough time, something like that. Um, and there's a, quite a few studies out now that are showing that contrary to the popular belief that the old school, the big boss or macho style leader uh, often are not seen as the ones who can best guide their institutions or organizations through difficult uncertain times. This uh, article, Harvard Business Review, says uh, today's leaders need vulnerability, not just bravado. And someone who has spoken a lot, uh, this I'll give her a quotation in a second here, but being vulnerable where in this context where it means allowing people more in your inner circle, in your close group, your small group, to know you fully, your thoughts, your challenges, uh, and of course, yeah, as a leader, it can be kind of scary to show those things uh, to others. Uh, we can feel of being judged uh, where there's a lack of, of uh, love or mutual understanding. So this aspect of vulnerability is one of the things that uh, we had wanted these AYLF small groups to be a space where people can be honest, be real. And uh, in that process, uh, you know, it leads to personal growth and healing. Uh, the lady I was talking about, Brene Brown, she's one of the, I guess, most influential women in the world. She's mentioned on something called the Top 100 Watkins uh, Living Spiritual Leaders that comes out every year. She's among them. But she's on TED Talks, and she says, vulnerability is not weakness. Vulnerability is the birthplace of connection. So let's talk about that for a second. Uh, when we're trying to be, you know, show that we are all okay and everything, we're in a space of competitiveness. When we let our guard down and be honest with people, we're in more of a space of connection and compassion. And she says that as a leader, um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't hurt to show that at times. Now, you don't want to show that all the time, if you're running for campaigns and you're talking about your issues and your problems, probably nobody will vote for you. So it needs some emotional or social intelligence to recognize when you're in spaces, when you can open up and, and people will still trust. Uh, there's an atmosphere of trust there and people will still respect and care for you. So, yeah, this aspect of vulnerability when you're going through a tough time, do you have people that you can be honest and real with and, and reach out to and show that you're not uh, cast iron, but you also have um, kind of uh, times when you are wounded? But again, it takes emotional intelligence to determine which audience, which kind of space can you be vulnerable and which you don't want to maybe uh, say things that people will use against you, especially if you're in a political environment. Yeah, some uh, couple tips here, or a few tips to cultivate vulnerability. Just be more humble and honest. Ask for advice when you're making decisions. When you make a mistake, apologize. Uh, listen to the counsel and support of the team around you. You're not always the one with all the answers. A uh, vulnerable leader is willing to listen to things that uh, people around them are um, able to speak on. So we've just run through one, two, and three, and now we're gonna to go to uh, four of my main points today of a leader as a wounded healer. So this one is just about the pathways to healing. And uh, the point, the point here, how we got wounded in life is probably not our fault, 
But healing from those wounds and growing beyond them is our responsibility and will make us better leaders. So we're not saying that, uh, yeah, you deserve to be wounded, but we're saying it's as a leader, it's your responsibility to not just stay wounded, but find healing, find ways to grow out of the situation. So the main idea here, here is if we experience and process some of these wounds or traumas that we go through, we will become better leaders. A lot of times when we're wounded, we come out of that situation with more compassion and more wisdom than we did going into it. If we don't do this, if we don't go through some kind of uh, healing or processing of our traumas, we tend to pass them on. This can come in your, your family later on in life. Maybe when you're married, you can come into your own children. You can be sort of like passing on generational traumas that were handed down from the picture shows the grandfather to the father to the son, and it just keeps going like that. So we can break some of these generational traumas or patterns of toxicity that maybe are running through a family and cancel some of that programming. If we ourselves learn to process our wounds and not just inflict them onto the next generation. So the idea here is up to, it's up to us to, to teach our children how to be healthy and balanced with love, acceptance, and compassion and not just uh, treat them maybe the way that we were treated, which caused some kind of uh, trauma within our own uh, our, our own childhood. And at the, uh, with this last point, we're looking at uh, three things, some common types of wounds that are uh, being experienced by many, and then setting boundaries, ways that you can set boundaries to protect yourself when the wounding that maybe you're experiencing is just getting too much and you're starting to break down, you're going to unhealthy coping patterns, you can set boundaries. And then uh, again, we'll finish with looking at pathways to healing. Okay, so I showed this one earlier, but these are some of the categories of wounds in life. Uh, again, painful relationships, family issues, loss of a parent. I lost my mother, as I said, when I was around 19 or 20, and that thing definitely affected me in ways that maybe I could not realize at the time, and I've had to uh, you know, face up to some of that. Physical health, poverty is a wound, like if you've grown up in a context where there just wasn't enough. Spiritual wounds, psychological, emotional, and so forth. So this is what we're talking about, and I'm sure each and every one of us on this call probably has been uh, experiencing some degree of wounding in one or more of these areas. Our closest relationships, like within our families, or our friends in our families, I should say, where we often get the most uh, toughest wounds, and mostly in the area, the wide category, calling emotional abuse. This is where um, the people that are closest to us, in the spaces where we're very close to people, where we suffer much uh, wounding, and that whole category is emotional abuse. So I did a bit of research on this here. Uh, this is something that I, I just pulled up. Uh, it says seven examples of emotional abuse. And with this one, there's uh, an element of manipulation that's kind of like underlying many of them. Uh, so the very first one is a funny one. It's called love bombing. But this is uh, actually a, a form of uh, manipulative when it's done in a fake way. One is showering you with love to make you feel like you are their best friend and the goal here is for them to get you emotionally attached to them, maybe to turn you into somebody else. Second one says stonewalling. Um, if you say blocking someone, like on uh, telephone or WhatsApp, uh, or just ignoring them, refusing to talk, like you pretend like someone's not even there, uh, don't make eye contact. It's it's cutting off someone's oxygen in a way emotionally, giving someone the silent treatment. 
Number three, we don't sense their children where uh, they they prevent them from being with you know friends or family. It's like someone who has control over you or a, let's say a husband who's over controlling of his wife who won't let her go out and develop her own relationships. Uh, number four says triangulation. This is like uh, someone is trying to turn you against another person which they don't like. So they start to spread rumors about that person and maybe they're even spreading rumors about you to that person like it's a triangle you another person and them and they're trying to manipulate you to not like someone or to feel like someone is against you it's just uh, a form of emotional abuse uh the fifth term gaslighting is um, something that just sort of popped up a few years ago and it's basically saying some things to someone to make them doubt their own sanity. Like, do you remember when you were a kid and nobody liked you? Like, something that wasn't even true, but it's making someone uh, to question, like, did, was I really like that? Uh, did I really behave like that? Like it's spreading fake information make you or you can't remember things properly. Uh, number, what is it? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, devaluation. This is just someone, their language, you're crazy, you're stupid, you're, you know, you, nobody likes you. Like, it's just a, a kind of way of breaking you down using critiques or insults. And then the last one is projection. So this is when uh, uh, pushes their own issues. They're They're having an issue, but they are projecting onto you as if it's, your problem. So they're calling you what they are, maybe accusing you of uh, having insecurities when it's really them who is insecure. So it's just like uh, projecting onto you something that they themselves don't want to own up to and face themselves. Okay, when that kind of emotional abuse gets too much and you're turning to alcohol or drugs or unhealthy coping habits or even committing suicide, it's a sign that you've gone beyond your capacity to endure it and you're going to have to set boundaries or you're going to break down. So it's up to you to determine, like all of us can accept a certain amount of abuse, but there's a point when it's just getting too much and it's breaking you down, especially uh, reaching a point of like, you know, you're just even thinking of suicide to get out of something. So when something is uh, taking you down this dark and dangerous spiral, to survive, you're going to have to establish what the psychologists call boundaries. In other words, these are self-protective mechanisms when things are just beyond your capacity to handle it anymore, and you see yourself getting pulled, pulled down, down, downwards in a very unhealthy way. So on the screen, you can see a picture of you know, what we're talking about, uh, this young lady had just decided I'm not going to let these people uh, mess me up. I have to set some boundaries. Now, there are several types of boundaries. We'll go into them in a minute. But from this screen, you can see on the extreme right, someone who has uh, too much boundaries, like they have put a wall around themselves. Uh, that's an excessive kind of thing. Nobody can get to them. And then moving from the right toward the left, uh, second from the right, I could say, the loose or porous. This is a person who's just too open. Anyone can walk in and abuse them. They'd have no kind of like protective personal space. And that's even worse than the third one. And then on the extreme left is healthy boundaries. Healthy boundaries means you have access to people. They have access to you, but it's not to the point where they are uh, just tromping into your life uninvited and breaking you down. So healthy boundaries uh, are in this illustration shown on the left, where it's not just like you haven't just walled yourself off, but the same way you're not overexposed. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, what are some areas where you might need boundaries? Number one, emotional boundaries. Um, you can be affected 
by every her thoughts, their actions, their reactions, their moods. I can't, be like, I can't stay with her anymore. She's extremely depressed. I'm there. I just get, I start going down myself. So it's like the uh, people that we stay with closely, they can have uh, a very toxic effect on us if they're, if they're going through a very dark moment and their emotions are impacting our own health. The second kind of bound, the time boundaries. There are people you can only be with for maybe one or hour a day, and that's a, the maximum. You can't be with them 24-7. Or maybe you're working in a company, and they're, they're forcing you to stay late, and you don't have uh, time for your own things. Maybe they want you to deal with business, take calls on the weekends and things like that. That would be a, a time boundary. Like you just tell people, look, I'm available from nine to five, but after that, that's my life. That's, uh, you know, don't expect me to be um, available. Mm -hmm. Topic boundaries. This is where someone is bringing up something, a topic that is painful to you. Like, when are you, are you making, like things that you don't want to talk about. You don't have to. You can choose your to put a boundary and stop volunteering information to others that you're not ready to discuss. Then the last is physical boundaries. Uh, this is when someone is encroaching on your personal space or with your possessions, like a roommate who is just borrowing your things or taking things when they've not even asked or walking in you know, on uh, places where it's your private uh, space, your private domain. Yeah, there could be other boundaries. This is showing us what we're talking about when we use the word boundaries to protect ourselves, especially against emotional abuse that's becoming to, or starting to break down. Okay, as I close, uh, seven pathways to greater healing. We'll just run through these one by one, but these are seven pathways or tools that are available to all of us to help us uh, process our wounds and gain health. Okay, so emotional health, the aim of it all is just bring your system back into wellness and balance. Really stressed out, you're, you're not doing well. And in regards to healing of trauma, this approach normally involves revisiting traumas that you have gone through in your past, reframing them, basically working with these traumatic memories in a ways that reduces how they are affecting us up to today in order to give ourselves a better sense of safety and control. So this process of counseling or healing us, a uh, process of desensitizing us, especially against what are called triggers, so that we don't just get constantly triggered easily and repeatedly. And we gain a greater sense of calm, safety, and predictability. Now, I'll come back to triggers, but triggers are basically your indicator. Uh, strong triggers as you sparks off emotional action you can take a while it's like people don't just get better overnight they get a bit better then they backslide they get better and they so they're kind of like steps that someone who has gone through, especially serious trauma. It's not a linear, so they say non-linear. You can cycle back, but each time, hopefully, it gets a little bit easier uh, for you to manage and eventually you get desensitized from that thing, that triggering thing that was like making you to remember all the pain that you've been through. Okay, seven pathways to greater health and healing. Okay, the first one, is called reframing. Reframing means changing the narrative. 
particularly on a narrative where you have seen yourself as a victim and you're changing the narrative to being a victor in simple terms. Um, and this is because in life, it's not actually the things that happen to us that make or break us. It's the story that we create around that thing that ends up either weakening us or empowering us. And you can see this with people who have gone through the exact same situation, but one has telling a different story about it. And the other is telling a story maybe that they were victimized and they're telling that thing over and over and over, whereas someone else can say, no, I went through it, but I, <laughs> it didn't kill me and I've come out of it. So it's reframing is just changing the narrative. Um, and it's a technique, actually, if you go to a counselor or whatever, this is their main technique. It's helping you to revisit painful situations, see it from a different perspective, and end up uh, in, in a situation where you're not just walking in a disempowered oh, victim. All right, here's an example from the Bible. We have this story of a man called Joseph. He was sold as a slave by his own brothers. I don't think anything of, any of us have gone through that. Uh, but later on, he rescued his family in a time of famine. I think you all are familiar with the story. And this is what he said at the moment that he was rescued. You know, He said, Genesis 50, verse 20, he said, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So what is he doing? He's reframing that whole experience and, and putting it in a positive light. And, and this needs to happen to things that are really breaking our hearts or stealing our joy. Try and find a way to look at it and recognize from the bigger picture something maybe uh, be is working out that is uh, actually for our good. And we have this uh, thought in our scripture that all things work together for good. You may not see it at the time, but out of that situation, if you have put faith into it and you reframe it and believe that God is in control of your life, it actually becomes something that makes you stronger. And especially it's this shift from the victim mentality, the victim mindset. Uh, those of you guys who like uh, football, <clears throat> you remember, you might remember this uh, player called Tevez, who used to play with uh, Manchester United, Manchester City. He had a big scar on his, uh, or wound on his neck. And uh, it was from his childhood when he was born uh, in the slums in Latin America. So he had this big thing on his neck, and as he got rich, everyone said, you know, you can, they can do some plastic surgery, some uh, work on it, and you won't, it won't be so obvious. You can cosmetically improve this thing, but he refused. And he said he wanted to keep that scar because it reminded him of where he had come from. So he was using that wound or that scar to empower himself. It was like a motivator and a reminder that he had overcome a lot to reach where he is today. So that's just an example of someone who uh, reframed that. Uh, they take something that could be a source of shame or embarrassment, trauma, they turn it around, reframe it so that it, it serves him rather than hurts him. So he's in charge of his story. And again, it's not what happens to us in life that actually impacts us the most. It's the story that we create in our heads about what happened. And we have to ask ourselves, by telling that story over and over, am I weakening myself or can I reframe it to a story of empowerment? The scar is simply a wound that is healed. So never be ashamed of a scar. It simply means you are stronger then whatever situation tried to hurt you or even kill you. All right, that's number one. Number two is a familiar one. We're talking about seven pathways to greater health and healing as a wider, as part of a topic, of, a wider topic of being a wounded healer. So reframing, changing the narrative, uh, look back on your experiences, find a way to tell a story that's a story of an overcomer, not a story of someone who's a victim. Number two, yeah, this is a very powerful one, forgiveness, choosing love. 
Uh, there's no spiritual teacher who has emphasized forgiveness like Jesus. He taught us that we should forgive 70 times 7. He put the phrase, forgive us our trespasses, into the Lord's Prayer. And his final words on the cross were, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So this is extremely powerful. We're talking about pathways to healing. And at the end of the day, for all of us, uh, some level forgiveness is required. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean what happened to us was okay. It just means I'm not going to carry that spirit of revenge and paying back that person in the same coin or the same thing that they did to hurt me. So it's dropping this spirit of revenge. So we're not saying forgiveness says you what they did was okay. We're just saying, I don't want to be connected to this person all my life. And it's like cutting a cord on a spiritual level. We are bound to people that we are having strong emotional feelings toward, whether love or hate. So if you have someone that has hurt you and you're still carrying bitterness and hate, you're bound to that person. And forgiveness is basically saying, I'm cutting the cord. I, I wish you well. Let God sort you out, but I'm not going to be uh, trying to revenge. Basically, that's what it's all about. And, you know, there are very many, uh, let's say, healing modalities that focus on them. One is the most famous one is a traditional Hawaiian prayer. And it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one. It's a, it's a practice of reconciliation and healing that involves res, uh, expressing remorse. It's very hard to say this, but to say to somebody uh, that you've been maybe in conflict with, I'm sorry, even if 95% of the problem was theirs, you're saying, I'm sorry for the 5% of the conflict that was mine, on my uh, cause. Forgive me for that. Thank you for teaching me a lesson, and I love you. I wish you well. These are extremely hard things to say when you've been hurt by somebody, but it's a very powerful tool to just like... Uh, disconnect that spiritual link that we have to somebody that we're actually hating or carrying a very strong bitterness. So we're looking at pathways to healing, and that's a very powerful one. Number three, group or family therapy. Uh, this is uh, something I've done myself. Uh, there was an issue that was in our family, and <clears throat> our daughter-in-law was doing counseling, and she suggested that we do a Family therapy. I'd never done this before, and I'm one of those men who don't like to <laughs> go and see counselors or admit, but I found it very refreshing and uh, a positive experience. And basically, it's where one or more trained counselors meet with a group of family, let's say family members, or any group of people that have been very close together and they're having some deep issues and they want to resolve them. Uh, one example of this in the region was when Rwanda, after the genocide, set up something called Gachacha Courts. And this was like every Friday in the areas where there was a lot of the genocide that had taken place, the whole community had to meet. And they met together, and then people who wanted to accuse someone would accuse them. And then the, the community was the judge, and they, they decided whether this person deserved a certain uh, punishment or whatever. But it was a it was a form of group or family therapy, you could say. <clears throat> and Rhonda found this to be more effective than taking people through the legal courts. But it's basically when a group comes together, or a family comes together to seek healing for something that has uh, torn them apart. Number four is individual therapy. Uh, this is what we normally think of when we hear the word therapy or counseling session. And it's simply where you go one-to-one -one with a counselor that helps to guide you on working through a personal challenge. And number five, this is an interesting, we're talking about pathways to healing. One of the most effective throughout human history is just having loving family or loving friends around you. You can go through a lot of things if you have a good support group, a group of loving, trusted friends uh, with which you can do life together. You can be vulnerable with them, and uh, they walk with you through the ups and downs. 
And this is actually what is behind the AYLF concept of a small group. Small group is just teaching us to cultivate good relationships with a few that can be part of our support group, our caring community. And actually throughout history and throughout, let's say, African culture, this was the method of healing. When someone has gone through a difficult time here in Africa, <clears throat> we say, don't leave them alone. Uh, just be with them. You know, someone has lost a family member or something, just be around, be around, around them. You don't have all the answers. You don't have solutions, but just be with them in that pain. So this is a, it's a powerful one. It's, it's being, uh, let's say, neglected in the modern era of individualism, but it's something that we in AYLF uh, try to cultivate. I'm, I'm part of a small group. I've, I've been in a small group for 20 years every Wednesday morning at 7.30. I just go down there. You know, we, and when you're with people for that long, you just have friends around you in any situation. You have people who are with you. Uh, one of our members just lost uh, a father and you know you're just surrounded by <clears throat> support so this underscores the importance of intentionally building strong social support network i would say if there's one thing that a lot of young leaders that i mentor over the years are failing in it's this one they just don't see the immense value of having a, a very strong support network around you and we neglect it but when we land in a problem and we look around that's when we need it you you have to do this ahead of time building and investing in a tight-knit circle of people you can trust it it helps you with your resilience to go through difficulties and weather uh, the storms of life okay uh, that's let's see we're going up to number five now we're on number six so we talked about group therapy we talked about individual therapy number six could be called self-therapy <laughs> self-therapy or self-work through just uh reflecting and expanding our own self-awareness and working with our triggers and shadow work so once you understand these basic concepts you can start to become like a therapist upon yourself and this term shadow work was coined by the father of modern psychology called Carl Jung. Him and Freud basically pioneered all of what uh, modern psycholog uh, psychology is based on. But he, Freud, uh, I mean, Jung, Jung had this uh, term shadow work. And it's, it's basically self-therapy, looking at the hidden areas of your life, those things that are maybe holding you back, or places where you have a wound, and bringing light. You don't need to necessarily have to have other people point it out to you. You can start to, through meditation, through reflection, self-awareness, develop your own uh, understanding of things that, that you have to work on. So shadow work is simply bringing more light to understand our own negative emotions and unhealthy behaviors and thoughts. I found it very <laughs> useful in in the area of personality types. I have a whole system of personality types that I study. And that thing has helped me immeasurably to see areas of my life that I wasn't seeing. Other people were seeing them, but I wasn't seeing them. And it brings the light of self-awareness in a very powerful way. And healing just comes from exposing them to the light. So here are some things you can do as shadow work or self-therapy. Try to walk back and just revisit yourself uh, some of the situations, mostly in your childhood, where you felt that thing kind of traumatized me and try and see how it's affecting you, you today. Like I say, you don't have to have all the solutions, but just shining the light of awareness. That's 50% of it onto it. Number two. Tune into the feelings around those things and just name them. You know, when Jesus was casting out demons, he would get them to name themselves. Like you're just naming. That thing is causing extreme independence in me. That thing is causing me to mistrust people. Just name it. Number three, look for the triggers. See how you get triggered even up to today. Recognize in those most dark moments that you went through where there was trauma, maybe from your childhood, 
God was actually with you in that situation. We think we're alone in a lot of these things, but recognize uh, God is walking beside us like that footprints, uh, that poem, Footprints, talks about. Number five, just forgive people who caused you pain. Even if you can just say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they did. You may not even have to face them. You may not see them. Just say the words. Just free yourself. I hope you guys are still with me. It's been a long trick. Uh, uh, time that we're here. almost. Uh, yes, we're here. Okay. Perfect. All right. And then number six, that reframing thing. Just create a different story. You say, yeah, that thing, you know, it put me through hell. But I can tell it stronger how it is. So you put a positive narrative on it rather than saying, you know, mm -hmm. caring that I was victimized by those people forever. Start to to reframe it in a way that uh, yeah makes you stronger. So again, those are triggers are just those. Uh, they're indicators. They're indicators. I still have an issue there. Every time someone brings that thing, I I feel it. So let me try and work on that. So you work with your triggers. And they show us uh, disempowering emotions. Like we get anxiety, we get stressed, we get hopelessness when that thing comes up. So you can see nowadays people are using quotations like this one. I'm taking my power back one trigger at a time. I'm identifying where I get triggered. I bring light to it. I try to unpack it, see what's behind it. And then I, I try to bring healing to that space, to reframe it, forgive those people, and just move forward. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, now, a lot of men, let me say, have difficult emotions. And this is a, something they're using with children. I, When I was in my son's, Eric, uh, he has some kids in a, a school in Kampala. I went into like a counseling room, and they had this thing on the wall called a feeling wheel. This is to help kids start to identify emotions, to put a name on it. As soon as you name something, you're on the journey to uh, bringing some healing to it. So sometimes, uh, you know, just trying to be very specific. What am I feeling? Like, what is that that vibe I'm picking up and, and trying to take it to a deeper level? And say, I think it's really, I'm feeling offended. Uh, it's causing me anger, but underneath it is I'm feeling offended. And then, you, you know, the, just bring light to it. Uh, when you bring a name or you put a name on it, you start to disempower that thing from just staying hidden there. That's shadow work. Hidden things are shadows that are affecting us that need to be brought into the light. All right. <clears throat> yeah, I use this uh, example how Jesus would, uh, when he was trying to cast the spirit out of someone, he would name it. And when you name it, you expose it. And when you expose it, the light shines on it. And the light of awareness, simple light, starts to dissolve it. So you can write things out on paper, or you can pour out verbally with a close friend. And in the process of just saying what you're going through, somehow there's a relief, there's a light that helps with the healing. So learn to see these emotional reactions as indicators. They are not your dictators. So if you have strong emotional vibes about something see it as an indicator and know that it's 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 a messenger it's not a master it's showing you an area that you can get mastery over and just to understand what is what kind of a spirit am i having right now i'm really down i i need to figure this thing out maybe take some time off and to get it. so those are the six and the last one is a pathway to healing which is kind of ironic, and that is bringing us back to the topic of being a wounded healer. And the thought here is that actually in helping others, we are helped. It seems counterintuitive, but the idea is of a wounded healer that on our way to help others, somehow we get, God has our back. We are experiencing some healing in the process of helping others. Now, a lot of times you hear people say, let me first figure myself out before I do anything for others. Well, if you have that attitude, you'll probably never start because the problems just keep coming. So wounded healer means, yes, I'm wounded, but that doesn't mean I can't do anything for others. And there's a paradox in all of this. 
and it's a spiritual paradox or a truth uh, that as we begin to help others, we actually actually activate a greater flow of uh, blessings of divine help coming into our life uh, because we're doing the business of God. We're doing the divine work of healing others. And in that way, we are also helped uh, in the process because God has our back when we're on the journey to help others. <clears throat> Oprah Winfrey puts it this way, helping others is the way that we help ourselves. Yeah, it looks like a paradox, but being a wounded healer means as you help others somehow, uh, you activate God's blessing into your life because we're designed to help others and not to just be selfish. So as we help others, there's a, a kind of a healing influence that pours in through us uh, that helps us as well. I like this saying that says, one day you will tell your story of how you've overcome what you are going through right now. And it will become part of someone else's survival guide. So as we go through these things as leaders, we recognize they're building something in us. They're building uh, an ability to help others say, you can overcome this. I was in that situation and I've, and I've kicked it. I was having trouble with alcohol. I'm now okay. It's like you're, you're showing people that they too can uh, overcome that thing that maybe they're going through. Now, this is an interesting one in Japan. Uh, there's a very kind of beautiful, expensive pottery. And it's a pottery that was broken, but they mend it back together using gold. It's an art form called kintsugi or something like that. And it's basically saying that there's a certain beauty that is found in something that is broken and mended. And bringing it to the human context, to ourselves, in the same way, our imperfections much like these cracks, when they're healed, they make us more beautiful. They make us more compassionate. They make us wiser. So in this whole process of wounding and being healed, there's something that's built into us that actually makes us uh, more precious in God's sight. And the most beautiful souls that the world has known are those that have gone through defeat, gone through suffering, gone through struggle, but they've come out of it. And these people have an appreciation, a sensitivity, an understanding of life that gives them more compassion, more gentleness, and more of a concern for others. So this is a quotation by Dr. Elizabeth uh, Kubler-Ross, uh, who is like an expert in dealing with grief. And she says, beautiful people do not just happen. They're actually created by overcoming adversity. So it's hard for us to accept that a lot of these wounds are actually blessings in disguise, but it just seems like a spiritual truth that these things that we go through are actually the things that make us better human beings in the long run, if we can uh, process them and experience healing. So these are the seven pathways as I close. The greater health and healing for the wounded warrior. We looked at the leader as being a healer. Then we looked at the leader is a wounded healer. We looked at vulnerability, like just being a bit open at times with your small group, your inner circle, when you're uh, wounded. And then we looked at uh, modalities or pathways to healing, last of all. In summary, a wounded healer is a spiritual warrior who develops the courage and strength to do the hard work of transforming their wounds into wisdom to change their story from being a victim to being a victor, and they become a light and a guide to others in the process. Uh, yeah, that's the whole story. I think I'll stop there. Uh, the rest of it is just uh, winding up, but our time is gone. So, um, yeah, you can get this Thank whole you. presentation.